So apparently while I was out having a baby, my students decided to build barricades. Go figure. It's Inferno, Inferno! Inferno. Canto 17 begins. Behold the beast with a pointed tail who can pass over mountains, who breaks walls and weaponry, who makes the world a festering morass. These were the words my master said to me while beckoning him to the cliff's edge, near the place where the marble pathway ended suddenly. Fraud's filthy image came to us apace, beaching head and torso at my master's sign, but leaving his tail to dangle into space. His face was the face of a just man, so benign was the outward aspect that it chose to wear, but beneath it his long trunk was serpentine. To the armpits, his two paws were thick with hair. His breast and back and both sides were arrayed with painted knots and ringlets everywhere. Never was a cloth that Turks or Tartars made so colorful in design and background, nor did Arachne ever weave such a rich brocade. The way a boat will lie along the shore, half in the water and half upon the ground, the way the beaver settles in for its war in the swilling German's land, was the way I found that worst of all beast perched upon the ring of a rocky ledge by which the sand is bound. The entire length of his tail was quivering in the emptiness and lifting its forked end, which had its point armed like a scorpion's sting. So Dante here describes Gerion as he rises up to the edge of the pit. They finally get to see him. He's a monster who has hair covering his torso and his huge arms, gripping the edge of the cliff as his tail dangles down below. His tail is serpentine like a snake, but the end is barbed like a scorpion. And the strangest aspect of all is his face, the face of a noble and just man. It describes him as looking just and benign, as if he is a person who values truth and honesty and rightness and fairness. Benign has to do with gentleness. So he sounds like a really nice guy, but down below he's a horrifying monster. And his hair is colorful and curled in ringlets, making it look beautiful and luxurious, but also terrifying. And worst of all is the lower end, the huge snake-like tail with a scorpion sting on it. So Gerion, symbolic of fraud, since they're about to descend in the fraudulent section, represents the way fraud looks pleasant on the surface, the way his face is noble and just and benign, but down below it's monstrous. The fraudulent souls are going to depict themselves as good and wholesome and attempt to win people over that way. But in reality, they're monsters inside. Gerion is also depicted as a special kind of mythological monster, the Manticore, with a human head, a lion body, and a scorpion tail. In mythology, if you look at the footnote, Gerion was not depicted as a Manticore, but he was depicted as having three parts, three heads, three bodies. And so here, Dante uses that similar tripartiteness to depict the manticore, the human head, the lion body, and the scorpion tail. Gerion is capable of floating up and down this cliff face that they're not able to climb down. But before they descend, Dante takes a moment to go talk to a couple of the usurers, who he didn't get to talk to when they were crossing the burning sand. Virgil sends him off alone, saying that he'll convince Gerion to take them. And this is interesting, because this is one of the first time that Dante talks alone to some of the sinners. This reflects some of the personal aspect of usury to Dante. Now, Dante's father was known to have been a usurer, and so Dante is dealing somewhat with a family sin, a personal sin. And so perhaps that's why he personally goes to these sinners and doesn't have Virgil with him. These sinners who are the usurers are sitting on the burning plain, as we mentioned before, holding these great purses that represents their usury, the way they used money. As we mentioned before, they are violent against art. I've already explained that idea in the last video, and so here I'm just going to give you some of the notes from the podcast that cover the same idea over again one more time. The users here um, are seated with these great purses around their necks, and on the purse is the emblem of uh, where they come from. So again, just their fixation with money, that their money is wrapped around their neck. Now usury, again, is the act of lending money in order to make money. Throughout history, users have always gotten the bad rap. They're always the people nobody likes because they always come around calling and, and uh, ask for their money. Um, they're debt collectors, pretty much. In order to understand the users fully, we have to go back to Canto 11, where we actually get the discussion of them. Back when we were looking at Canto 11, I mentioned I would come back and talk about this. Usury is one of the types of ultimate violence in the violent circle. Here, uh, Dante describes the concept of usury as an abuse of art. Art is something from God. 
Um, and he calls it God's grandchild because human beings create art. They were made to create art. Uh, they were, that's how they're supposed to earn their bread, he says. Art, in this sense, is a very general term for art. It's not specifically paintings or something like that. Um, it's more something that is produced um, and a sense of creation. Human beings were created by God, and in turn, they create. Uh, on the other hand, he says, usurers have chosen another road. They've taken another road. They've um, chosen, instead of creating, to just turn money around and create more money out of money. So they're not actually producing anything. They're not creating anything. Um, they're simply making their living off of nothing. This idea of art as a sense of creation um, and a, as a sense of um, what human beings can do comes from Aristotle. He mentions Aristotle here, um, the physics, etc. And Aristotle was actually in argument with his teacher, Plato. Plato in the Republic and elsewhere discusses the role of art as a sense of mimesis or imitation. And um, he talks about the, the world of ideals or the, uh, the place of ideals, how everything in this life seems to be an imitation of the perfect idea. So uh, every chair is an imitation of what the perfect chair would be in some ideal place. So when we create a chair, we create it for its functionality. It's not perfect, it's flawed, but it's an imitation of what a perfect chair would be. On the other hand, Plato says, art is an imitation of an imitation. It's a copy of a copy of the ideal. So when we draw a chair, it's less useful. It's not even functional. It's a copy of a copy, and therefore less significant and less important than the real thing. Poetry is the same thing. It's a copy of a copy. And, uh, and Plato would even say it stirs up our emotions too much and makes us womanly and weak. At least he does so in the Republic. Aristotle argues with him here, as we see, and, and uh, describes the act of art as an act of creation and therefore making us, elevating us and making us more godly. After he finishes with the users, Dante returns to Gerion, who's now ready to take them down. And then Dante, for the rest of the canto, describes the terrifying descent into the pit. He comments on Phaeton and Icarus, two mythological figures who had horrible experiences in flight. And the whole trip down is terrifying, but he manages to make it, and they're safe at the base of the cliff, and Gerion flies up again. Now we've come to the Eighth Circle, the third major section in the Inferno. This, as we mentioned, is the fraudulent, symbolized by the leopard. These are the ones who thought their sins through and calculated them before committing them. Now the Eighth Circle is wide and filled with ten smaller ditches, each representing a different kind of fraudulence. Each little ditch or pouch has a bridge over it, so Dante is able to descend down and peek over the edge and look at each of the kinds of sinners down in their ditches without having to get down with them. With a few exceptions, of course. This system of ditches or pouches of evil is called the Malbogie. So the first ditch is full of the panders and seducers. These are the pimps. They're people who drove human flesh around. They're people who cause inappropriate relationships. And because of the way that they drove human flesh around, they're being whipped by demons who are driving them around and around and around in a circle. Up above, we saw the sin of lust, which is an impulsive kind of sin, where one person falls for another and lets their impulses run away with themselves. However, down here, we see a similar sin, a related sin, but this one is more calculating. This is the person who cleverly planned through bringing two people inappropriately together. One of the sinners we see down in this particular section is Jason, who is known for his sexual exploits and for causing grief to many, many women. Ultimately, Medea was one that was pretty ticked at him. But now we come to the second pit, which is full of the flatterers. And the flatterers love to use eloquent language and beautiful words to disguise something that was not so beautiful. Very appropriately, they're bathing in human excrement. They're covered in poop. The feces smeared all over them symbolizes what they are trying to hide with their language and also the value of the language itself. We mentioned before that Dante tends to use specific kinds of language that emphasizes what he's talking about. Well here, in order to avoid a claim of flattery, he uses some of the most blunt and straightforward language possible, even to the point of using profanity and crude language. Now we get to Canto 19, which is another of the most significant moments in the Inferno. Dante begins Canto 19 saying, O Simon Magus, 
and many more besides, his wretched followers who have whored and sold the things of God, which ought to be the brides of righteousness for silver and for gold. Now must the trumpet sound for you, I say, because the third pouch has you in its hold. Now the Dante who is saying this is the Dante who's writing the poem. It's Dante the author. So it's not Dante the traveler who's actually moving through this section. In other words, Dante the author, in his little room at his desk, is speaking to Simon Magus. Now, Simon Magus can't hear him because Simon Magus isn't in the room with him. In fact, Simon Magus is back down here in hell. Have you ever spoken to someone who's not there? At first that sounds a little crazy, but you've probably done it more often than you think. Consider the times you've been driving along in your car and all of a sudden someone cuts you off and you start yelling at them. Can they hear you? No. Or perhaps as you're watching a movie and you see the characters about to do something you don't want them to do and you start talking to them and telling them not to do it. Or maybe you're listening to the radio and you're listening to some political commentary and you start talking to the people because you think they're stupid. All of these commentaries come from an outburst of emotion. You get so excited or angry or emotional that you just have to burst out talking to the person even though they can't hear you. There's actually a literary term for this. It's called the apostrophe. And of course when you think apostrophe, you think of the punctuation mark. And that's not really far wrong. The punctuation mark in our language represents letters that are missing in a word. Think about it. There's two times when you might use apostrophe. Number one, you might use it when you're using a contraction, when you combine two words and drop some of the letters. The apostrophe marks where you left out the letters. Or you also use them in possessive nouns. You add an apostrophe s to the end of a possessive noun to show its possession. But actually this is connected to an old way of spelling things. A long, long, long time ago, people used to spell out possessives by adding an ES at the end. So Bill's car would be B-I-L-L-E-S. But eventually they started dropping the E and adding the apostrophe in. So the apostrophe represents the missing E. So if apostrophes mean letters are missing here, then a literary apostrophe is when I talk to someone who's not there. This might be a person who just doesn't have to be in the room with me. It might be a person who's gone. It might be just an idea, like I might speak to death or to love or to happiness. But as I mentioned before, this apostrophe tends to come from an outburst of emotion. Look at the way each of these apostrophes start. The first one in the text starts with, oh, Simon Magus. It starts with O. Oh. Later in this canto, Dante's gonna show another apostrophe to Constantine. It's line 116. Ah, Constantine, how much evil seed was sown, not with your conversion, but with your dowry. Oh, ah. All of these groans are these outpourings of emotion. Dante is connecting this section to prophecy, to Old Testament prophecy. Most of the time we associate prophecy with foretelling the future, but it's not just about foretelling the future. It's also about carrying the words of a deity to a people. Dante is connecting particularly here to the Old Testament prophets like Jeremiah. And Jeremiah certainly was an emotional guy. These Old Testament prophets saw how evil what the people were doing was, and they brought the message of God to the people saying, you're doing wrong, you better straighten up. Jeremiah specifically told the people again and again how horrible their actions were, and nobody ever listened to him. He was a pretty miserable guy, actually. He also talks about how he tries to hold back the message, but it bursts out of him as if he can't control it. It burns inside, he said. And so this apostrophe, this, oh, ah, I must tell you this message, sounds very much like a Jeremiad. A Jeremiad is a term we use in literature, taken from the prophet Jeremiah, to describe an angry rant. A good example of a Jeremiad is Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl. It's a long poem ranting about the 60s and 70s and the culture, the drug culture, the war of Vietnam, all the inappropriate things going on in the streets. So as Dante has explored other forms of poetry, here he's going to take on this prophetic voice. Now, who is this Simon Magus he's talking to anyway? Well, Simon Magus, or Simon the Sorcerer, is a character from the Bible. He's famous for converting to Christianity after hearing some preaching, but then wanting to buy special powers of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he represents this whole section. These are the Simonists, those who used holy things inappropriately and tried to buy and sell holy things. Mostly, they're priests and bishops and popes who use their religious power to make personal gain. There's also an apocryphal story of Simon Magus jumping off of a cliff to attempt to fly, and then falling down headfirst to his death. This story of being upside down connects not only with the contrapasso of these sinners, but also with another important Simon from the Bible, Simon Peter, who is, in Catholic tradition, the first pope. 
Here, he parallels in some ways Simon the sorcerer, but they come to different ends. Simon Peter was crucified upside down, hence the upside downness. His name was also Simon, but he made better choices. He chose what was good and what was right, as opposed to this Simon, who chose what was bad. As Dante begins to cross this bridge, he looks down and speaks again. O oh, highest wisdom, how great your art, with which the heavens, the earth, and the evil world resound, and how justly does your power deal with each. O oh, highest wisdom, another apostrophe. Along the bottom of the sides I found in the livid stone a multiplicity of identical holes that were all completely round. By their dimensions they reminded me of my San Giovanni. They were all the same size as the fonts in that beautiful baptistry, one of which I had to break once. Otherwise, someone would have drowned inside it. And here, let this be the seal that opens all men's eyes. So Dante sees all these circular holes in the side of this ditch. And inside each of these holes are the Simonists. What do these holes represent? Well, Dante connects them with a baptistry in his own town. So these circular holes look like baptismal fonts, and all of the sinners are upside down inside of them, as if they're taking a holy symbol and using it inappropriately. But Dante has a really strange story here, where he describes breaking one of the baptismal fonts in his own baptistry. He said, I had to break one once, otherwise someone would have drowned in it. Let this be the seal that opens all men's eyes. But the weird thing is, Dante completely makes this story up. First of all, Dante never really broke a baptistry. Second of all, there would have been no point in breaking the baptistry, because that wouldn't have helped him rescue a drowning person inside of it. So why does he tell this story? Well, it has to do with the symbolism of what's going on down here. These people are in hell because they abused holy things. They used holy things for their own gain. Dante says, I broke a baptistry. I broke something holy, but I did it for a good reason. I did it to save someone's life. Therefore, I am excused. Let this be the seal that opens all men's eyes. In other words, motive is what matters. It's the willfulness of the sin that's gotten these people down here, not just the action. Dante goes on to continue the symbolism of holy things. Protruding from each hole, there was a set of feet, with legs up to the calves in view. All the rest was in the hole, pressed into it. The soles of their feet were burning, and their legs flew so hard in convulsive thrashings that their throws could have broken withes, or even ropes in two. On any oily substance, fire flows along the surface, and here was the same as the flames licked at their feet from the heels to toes. Notice more holy symbolism there. There are tongues of flame upon these feet, representing the tongues of flame that descended upon the apostles at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming down. Also, it describes the feet as being covered with oil, burning oil. The oil could represent that anointing oil on top of holy people. These people are covered with holy symbolism, but all of it is inverted and backwards. Instead of on their heads, it's on their feet. They're upside down. Then Dante notices in particular one soul whose feet are really cranking it. It's Pope Nicholas III. Have you noticed that Dante doesn't like popes? We talked about that. Go back to video one if you need to. But here Dante is going to condemn not just one pope, but three. Virgil carries Dante down to speak to Pope Nicholas. And as soon as Dante leans over the pit, he addresses him and says, Whoever you are, sad spirit, I began, stuck in like a pole with the upper part interred where the lower end should go. Speak if you can. I stood there like a friar who has heard the confession of a killer who, placed inside, calls him back so his death may be a bit deferred. Notice the symbolism there. Here he is leaning over Pope Nicholas III. But he's describing himself as the friar who's speaking to the sinner. He's taking confession from the Pope. Now in the Catholic Church, there's two groups of people. There's the clergy and the laity. The clergy are the church leaders. They're the ones in charge. The laity are the common people who listen to the instructions of the clergy. The clergy are responsible for the spiritual well-being of the laity. A priest can take confession from the laity. Dante is definitely laity. His job is not in the church. He's a poet and a politician. But here he takes the role of a priest, accepting confession from the pope. Their roles are reversed because Dante is the holy one here and the priest is the despicable one. Dante takes on the prophetic voice, saying that he has the voice of God coming to him, and the Pope, who's supposed to be the voice of God, is now as low as they go. Pope Nicholas III at first takes him for Boniface VIII, but after they get the whole identity thing straightened out, then Nicholas confesses his crimes to Dante. He also prophesies that Boniface VIII and the Pope after him will also be here with him eventually. And here's where Dante begins to speak in the prophetic tone. Listen to this. I do not know whether in my vehemence I grew too bold in the thought that I expressed in this measure. Tell me, on what recompense, on how much treasure did our Lord insist before he placed the keys in Peter's hand? Follow me, I'm certain, was his sole request. Nor did Peter and the others demand gold or silver from Matthias, 
when it befell that he took the bad soul's place in their holy band? So stay here in your fitting spot in hell. As for those ill-gotten gains that made you bold toward Charles, be certain that you guard them well. And if this intensity were not controlled by my deep reverence for the sacred keys in that happy life you used to hold, I would speak in even stronger words than these. For your greed, grinding down the good, giving glory to the wicked, afflicts the world with its disease. And when the evangelist had that beast in view who sits in the waters, whoring wantonly with kings, he was thinking of shepherds just like you. She had seven heads when she was born, and she grew her strength from the ten horns. But it was gone when her spouse lost his delight in purity. With your gold and silver god, what you have done differs from the idolaters, and this alone. You worship a hundred, they worship only one. Ah, Constantine, how much evil seed was sown, not with your conversion, but with your dowry, which the first rich father had from you as his own. So Dante really chews him out here. He compares him to Peter again, saying that Peter did not take any money or pay any money to become the first pope. And Matthias, an apostle who was elected after Judas Iscariot died, didn't have to pay any money. Then he uses some of the prophetic language of revelation to condemn him and say, you are just what was being prophesied before. And he closes with another apostrophe to Constantine. Constantine was the first Roman emperor to accept Christianity, and so he's usually celebrated as a pretty good guy. However, Dante references his dowry, which was a gift of land to the church. Actually, Constantine didn't give any land to the church. It was based upon a forged document that several church leaders pulled together and wrote in order to get more political power to the church. Dante is again differentiating between church and state. When the church takes control of politics, it goes sour. But notice his anger here. He tries to check himself and says, if I didn't respect the office of Pope so much, I would be a lot more vicious here. And he says, I do not know whether in my vehemence I grew too bold. It's as if his anger is taking control and leading him to say these words. Very much the idea of the Jeremiad and the prophecy. When he finishes, Pope Nicholas' feet twitch even faster. And Virgil basically gives him a pat on the back and carries him back up. So Dante does well with this prophetic voice. However, he also feels pretty good about himself for having given that condemnation of Pope Nicholas III. He better watch out, because the prophetic voice isn't always a good thing. See you next time. It's Inferno, Inferno!